Grace, mercy, and peace to you who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read it again for you a portion from our second lesson. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. Today is Pentecost, one of the greatest festivals of the Christian church. We read a portion of that story in our first lesson from Acts, when the Holy Spirit came on the disciples visibly in tongues of fire and enabled them to speak in other languages that they had never studied, never learned, so that they were able to share that gospel message of full forgiveness through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection with all those visitors to Jerusalem coming there to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. And that's exactly what Peter did. He shared with the crowd who had, some of them accused them of being drunk. They weren't drunk on wine, but that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And through faith, that's true of you and me as well. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul has a message for those who have believed the Gospel. Paul informs the Corinthians how the Holy Spirit has filled his church with gifts. Now this is worth our time to think about. Now some of the gifts Paul talks about are miraculous gifts. And I guess that kind of always brings up the question in our mind, why, why don't we see miraculous gifts in the church anymore? Right? Well, you kind of got to go back and understand what the purpose of miracles has been. There's really two main purposes. One, it kind of backed up the prophet's word that they were a prophet sent from the Lord, that God gave them signs to do. And two, it drew attention to their message. In all of history, there's really three times in which God has given people the ability to do miracles. Moses and Aaron, Elijah and Elisha. And then the apostles and disciples at the time of Jesus. And so really, as we look at that, it, as much as we like to still see miracles in the church today, they really seem to fade away after the message was completed, after the New Testament was written down and finished. We, we see miracles simply fading away from the church. However... We're told in verse 7 of our text that the Holy Spirit continues to give spiritual gifts to each one in the church. This is one of the places verb tenses are important. In fact, there's a lot of them. But it says, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given, really is being given, continues to be given for the common good. Now at first glance, spiritual gifts may seem just like talents, but we're told these are given by the Holy Spirit. Maybe, maybe just briefly think about it this way. Talents we tend to think of individually, don't we? They're, they're my talents, I possess them. The point of what we're told here about spiritual gifts is that they're given for the common good. Not for me personally, but for the good of all of us. For the good of the church. Now there are some who say to themselves, and maybe even say out loud, I don't really have any gifts. I, I'm not really good at anything. You know, let it never be said God's word isn't practical because there's a very practical answer here for someone who would say such a thing. I know you are gifted. You know why? Because God says that you are gifted. Because God says that he has given you gifts. Now maybe what someone might mean by that is I'm not as gifted as I want to be or I'm not as gifted as so-and-so may be. Now whether or not that's true, that's really a separate question. But we need to really stop today and think about a simple and yet a profound truth. Who gives the gifts? It's God, right? That goes back to kind of what we're studying in Sunday morning Bible class right now with Moses. 
Moses at the burning bush, God came to him and was telling him, look, I'm sending you to bring my people Israel out of Egypt, right? And we looked at Moses' excuses. And he has a list of them from one into the other. And then finally he gets to, I'm slow of speech and tongue. Well, first of all, that appears to be another excuse in the line of his other excuses. And you know why? We're told in the book of Acts that Moses was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. In other words, he had the best possible education money could buy. Do you really think that with that kind of education he was slow of speech and of tongue? But, but even on the off chance that he is, God's answer really silences him, doesn't it? God says, just quite simply, bluntly, who gave man his mouth? In other words, look, if I created your mouth, you're making your tongue move is not going to be that hard at all. So to someone who says they're not gifted, you know what my encouragement is? It's not even to focus on the gifts so much as focus on the giver. God. Instead of comparing ourselves to others, what we need to do is learn to appreciate the gifts God has given and be content with them and faithfully use them instead of looking longingly at what God has given to other people. Because, let's face it, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? At least until you get there, as we well know and we've experienced. Ultimately, it's as we start thinking about some of these attitudes a little bit deeper, if we complain about the gifts that we've received, what is that really saying about Jesus? See, we confess Him to be Lord, right? But if we're complaining about what He's given through the Holy Spirit, are we really then saying, Lord, you don't know everything? You don't know what's best for me? Is that not really a questioning of God Himself? Do we think we know better than He does? Are we despising what's been given through the Holy Spirit? Kind of, yeah. If that's an attitude. And so, the opposite attitude is one of trust. Trust that these gifts are given for the common good. Even the person, I mean, think, think about this for a moment. Even the person with the least possible amount of gifts has been gifted by God, right? Now, there are some implications here as you start to think about that. That means if God is the one that has gifted them, what in the world is there for any of us to look down on them for as being less gifted, right? If God's the one that's gifted them, to do so would be to despise the giver of the gift, right? And conversely, what reason does anyone have to be not content with the gifts given, to be frustrated, looking, well, they have more. When we recognize God as the giver, it changes everything. You see, as with so many sins, it's easy to think little of them until we start thinking a little bit deeper. I think it's safe to say that we all have some things to repent of here. I, I know I do. There are many times I found myself not being content with what God's given. Understanding all of this, it comes from the Gospel. It comes from an understanding, first of all, God's grace in your life, what He has done for you, that He's wiped away your sins, removed them as far as the east is from the west, and in that comfort that you may show that grace to others. You see, these gifts are what the Holy Spirit has given to believers for the common good. They may seem like talents, but again, so often we look at our talents as something that's mine, that's my possession, that I earned, that I worked for, and that I can use however I want. And so while there's really some overlap with our talents here, we, I want to maybe encourage you to think about spiritual gifts just slightly differently because the purpose is for the common good. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the good of the church, that all of these gifts work together. We need to really be filled with the Spirit, be filled with faith, to understand in faith what God is telling us about these gifts. Maybe what we need to do is go on a little bit and look at the picture that Paul uses immediately following this section in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
You, you see, these gifts aren't for our own benefit, and I, I think often that's one of the hang-ups for us, where, where we get sidetracked. So often we think, too small, and I look at what I've been given, and you look at what you've been given, and we miss the point. It's maybe like a story, maybe you've heard this one before. There were four blind men in a village, and they, they heard a strange noise, and so they went to investigate. And the first one comes up and feels the trunk, and this feels like a really thick snake. Second one feels the leg and says, this feels like a tree trunk. The third one feels the side, and this feels like a solid wall. The fourth blind man feels the tail and says, this feels like a rope. And each one in their own small heart was correct. And yet, what did those four blind men miss? The elephant! They, they looked at a small part of it and missed the whole. So often we do that as well. We, we get this tunnel vision in thinking about our gifts, and we miss the point that the Holy Spirit has given them, not for me or not for you, but for the common good to be used together. The, the picture that Paul goes on to use is that of a body. Now, think about your own body. You have all kinds of parts, thousands and even millions of them, depending on what detail you get down into. Well, we have, what do you want to say? Weaker and stronger parts, quote-unquote, important and less important parts, right? You've got all kinds of parts of your body you don't think of on a regular basis. You just take them for granted, at least until something goes wrong. I mean, you, you don't think about your intestines that often until something's wrong, and then that's kind of a pretty big deal, right? Is there really, ultimately, any unimportant part in your body? No. They all work together for the common good. Well, God is saying that about us as a church. That he's given all these gifts for the common good to be used together so that if we're looking individually at the gifts given, we are missing the picture just like those blind men miss the elephant. We have a need for some repentance here. I, I know there's times when I've looked down on others stupidly, sinfully. And I, there's also been plenty of times when I, I've looked at myself, why, why haven't I been given as many gifts as someone else has been given? Well, brothers and sisters, the cross reminds me that I desperately need a Savior just as everyone else does. The, the cross is the great equalizer. And it's comforting. It, it doesn't tell me or you that there's anything that we need to do it tells us that everything has been done. That Jesus did it all. Which means, as we think about using the gifts that we're given, there doesn't need to be any kind of guilt. There doesn't need to be this selfish kind of motivation or this, I I'm a better part, I have better gifts, I'm more gifted. Any of those sinful attitudes there. But rather, thanksgiving. First of all, thanksgiving to the one who's done it all for me. Thanksgiving to Jesus for washing away my sins. Thanksgiving to the Holy Spirit for the way that He has blessed us. Why is it sometimes so hard to just be, thank God for the ways that He has gifted other people? It doesn't make us to be any less to praise someone else for the gifts that God has given them. To, to see how they all work together, how God has gifted us as a congregation for the good of His church, not individual members. So thanksgiving to the one who's gifted us, and thanksgiving for all these gifts that fit so well together. Brothers and sisters, we say that Jesus is Lord, and we do that by the Holy Spirit. He lives in us through faith. We trust that Jesus' death on the cross has washed away all of our sins, even for times when we have not faithfully used the gifts God's given. They're washed away. And when we trust that we're saved by grace, not by what we've done, we, we realize the same is true for everyone else in this building. When we realize that, what is there for us to brag about? What is there for us to be frustrated about? Nothing. God is the one who's given these gifts, isn't He? 
God is God, the one who wants you to be in heaven with him has uniquely equipped each and every one of us so that these gifts work together in his church for the common good. What he asks is faithfulness in using them. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So instead of focusing so much on the gifts we haven't been given, or even focusing on the gifts we have been given, when we understand that the Holy Spirit is the giver, again, what is there to brag about? Or what is there to complain about? What God wants from us is faithfulness in using these gifts and talents in service to Him and in service to His kingdom. As a body that we work together for the good of the whole, for the mission of the church, which is to go out into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. He's worked faith in your heart through your baptism. He's nurtured that faith and caused it to grow. So you can wake every day confident of your forgiveness, confident of your salvation, because you have been baptized. And confident in that, knowing that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that you have been filled with the Spirit, you can confidently go about using the gifts of the Spirit, not for yourself, but for the common good, for the good of God and His church. Amen.